Hello, my name is Rudolf Hertle. I am a retired pastor and the son of the missionary couple Wilhelm Hertle and Hedwig Hertle. My parents were the first Lutheran missionaries to enter the Wiro area, and I am here to tell you the story. I want to tell you how it happened. This is part five of a YouTube series on the beginnings of the Tiripini circuit. Today we will look at how my father started the station, and this part is therefore called Starting the Tiripini Station. My father had just come back from the remarkable trip to the Wiro area and had secured land from the village of Kao where the mission station Tiripini was to be built. But it took him up to January 1961 until he was able to start with the building. The picture shows the first small makeshift huts in Tiripini. Construction material was used on a spot from bush material. As you can see, the very first huts were just tied together with local materials. Later, materials were used from the old house in Yalibu that was dismantled and boards salvaged and carried to Tiripini. My father lived in Tiripini without his family in a small hut and supervised the construction of his large family house. But luckily, he had a radio transmitter and was able to communicate to all regions. His workers built themselves small huts. The house of the missionary was a quite elaborate construction and took much time and hard work to complete. This picture shows the framework of the house. The walls needed to be woven with pit pit. When a new house in Tiripini was completed in May 1961, my mother packed all her belongings into small parcels and had them carried to Tiripini. On Monday the 8th of May, my mother stepped into the vehicle that the Commissioner Fowler had provided for her to transport her to Tiripini. She took all of her belongings into the car and drove with the car as far as the road would take them. When the vehicle got bogged, she stepped out and started to walk the rest of the way to Tiripini. My mother was delighted to see the new house, which was spacious and well built with four layers of pit pit walls, all insulated with tar paper. Windows were made of washed x-ray film. It also had a special room for guests. Flooring was made from limbung, the bark of the black palm tree, while the bedroom had proper boards as flooring. Window frames and doors were made of boards. The sketch of the plan of the house shows the different rooms. On Friday of the same week, my parents had the Commissioner Fowler and his wife for tea. During that week, masses of men were running with spades to build the airstrip and were singing, which was an expression of enthusiasm at the beginning of contact. My parents were surprised at the joyful atmosphere of the men as work proceeded. Patrol reports show that talks between the government and the Wiros had come to a mutual understanding that the Wiros would get development for hard work. On the way home, the men crowded into the house of my parents and wanted to inspect everything that was in the house, looking into every pot. Later on, my parents had to make barriers just for privacy's sake. A week later, my father started a trip to visit all the evangelists in the outstations. He wanted to give them their salary. By the 15th of August, he had 15 outstations. The evangelists did not get as much salary as the Catholic catechists, but they were doing their work. After returning from that trip, he put all his energy into the construction of a trade store, a store, house, and setting out a garden. By August, he had built a school, a dispensary, housing for the evangelists, teachers and laborers, besides several small structures for the house, and a small house for outpatients, 
who had to stay overnight. He was also able to secure a piece of forest and could cut timber from the trees for further buildings. As the Catholic priest had decided to wait a little until he came and established his house in Pangia, and the government station was only opened in September, it is therefore safe to say that my parents were the very first Europeans to live in Pangia. During the first months, my father started to give Bible lessons on Sundays, and he started with the stories of the Old Testament, beginning with the story of creation. The people were interested to hear these stories, but they also had many questions. The people said, we don't understand. It is obvious that the Wirus were trying to understand the gospel in the terms of their traditional cult, which was essentially a fertility cult. It took some time for them to understand that the gospel was bringing them a message of love, hope, peace, reconciliation and salvation. My father said he had no time to learn a language but had to start preaching right away because of the different denominations. For this reason, he used an interpreter. In his mission approach, he followed the generally accepted method of the Lutheran mission, based on many years of experience in mission work, which dated back to the renowned Reverend Christian Kaiser. The people should first come to understand who God is, before repentance could be preached. This was done by teaching them stories of the Old Testament. My mother said, we have to proceed slowly. They cannot understand so many things and are deeply rooted in their traditional belief. It is obvious that my parents did not want to exert pressure, but to give them freedom to come to their own decision. For this reason, my parents had to be patient with the people. This stood in contrast to the fundamentalist Bible mission. My mother said, they make such terrible mistakes. They burn down the spirit houses and a missionary fired a bullet into the house to prove that no spirit existed there. They tell the people, when the roads are finished and the airport completed, then Christ will come again. They also conducted a public confession of sins which nearly led to a riot as people discovered what they had done to each other. When rumors came up that the Lutheran mission was called a rubbish mission, my father compel was compelled to inform the congregation on the true nature of the Bible mission. Instead of preaching faith and confidence, they were creating an atmosphere of fear and anxiety. This is particularly true when they spoke of the, when they threatened them with the second coming of Jesus. He also informed the people that the Lutheran mission was an established church with its own bishop and now looked back on a history of 75 years in Papua New Guinea, having congregations all over the country. He also tried to speak with members of the Bible mission at that time, but was not able to contact them. Unfortunately, they had encroached into the area of the Luther mission and were now writing down the names of children who held to the Luther mission. The locals then fired a complaint to the Kiap. Up to August 1961, the Sunday services had been conducted in the open space. But then my father decided to erect a church building made of bush materials. Although the ground was wet on the projected site and even swampy, my parents measured out the space for the church. The posts were put into place and after a week the frame of the church was done. It was quite large and the students and women carried grass for the roof. The church was dedicated on Sunday the 3rd of December, 1961. My father called all the evangelists to the station for a conference at that weekend. They, in turn, invited the members of their congregations from the outstations to come and witness the ceremony. 
the former place where the service had been held was packed full of people. The evangelists played a sketch. Some weirdos were dressed in traditional attire, were busy erecting a spirit house. On the other side, a group of people were having a devotion with the evangelist. Then the group building the spirit house stopped the work and listened. They started a discussion and eventually decided to join the group of Christians. Then the evangelist stood up and spoke to the group. We do not command you to tear down your spirit houses, but to listen to the word of God. Then you can come to your own decision later. My father addressed the congregation. God sent us to give you the word of God and to proclaim the good news. For this reason, this house has been built. The people then marched to the door of the church. The headman of the Kao village opened the doors of the church and all men marched in. There were so many, my mother was thinking they would not fit inside. But when the women came inside, the building was packed full. People were sitting on the seats, standing in the aisles. My father held a sermon, and his message was simple and to the point. This house of God is here to listen, to pray, and to give thanks to God. The congregation sang some newly composed hymns, which my mother had composed with the help of the evangelist. The evangelists from the Yavim sang hymns from Tok Pisin. Then the station evangelist Korowa addressed the congregation and explained to them the difference between the spirit house and the house of God. It was a very impressive ceremony, and the people were deeply moved. At this occasion, my father made a clear cultural and theological statement which would be heard throughout the region until the last village. He would not interfere with cultural tradition and religious practice. Instead, he would proclaim the good news. He would like to have enjoyed the moment and would be able to rest. After lunch, he was called to an outstation in four hours walking distance, and my mother was not able to sit down and share lunch with my father because the dispensary was full of patients and they were waiting for treatment. One household girl prepared lunch for my father the other girl and the boy assisted my mother at the dispensary. Even on that memorable day, there was no time for celebration. The normal station life had taken its course. If you are interested to find out how the story continues, I would be very happy to welcome you. The next part is called My Mother's Contribution.